Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we got a panel over here, how to build a chart busting game. I think we have a, a pretty good panel, um, some great companies, uh, and I think, you know, we'll get into, we'll have a pretty interesting conversation. Um, I think to, to kick it off, um, so I'm Mark, um, I work at AppLovin, I run uh, Revenue, we're a mobile marketing platform, um, doing uh, a significant amount of uh, spend on behalf of, of companies, uh, of many game companies, of most game, game companies actually. And uh, yeah, I think uh, what would be great is if, if each of you guys can, uh, you know, just uh, give your name, um, you know, the company, and uh, just give a little bit of background on yourself and your company would be great. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Akavan. I'm the president of publishing at Glue Mobile. I'm responsible for the company's business operations like user acquisition, ad revenue, BD, etc. Um, if you guys don't know about Glue, we make games like Kim Kardashian and Deer Hunter and Racing Rivals and Cooking Dash. I'm Barry Dorf. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships and Alliances for DNA, uh, essentially business development for the Western business. If you don't know DNA, we're a, a public company in Japan with revenues around $2 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, games like Final Fantasy, Record Keeper, Blood Brothers, uh, and Kaito Real. I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Brian Chi. I'm a director of product management at Pocket Gems. Um, I work on the product team, so basically leading uh, teams to build new games. I work in our core studio, working on a new title under development. Um, Pocket Gems is a mobile game company based here in San Francisco. Um, you know, we started back in the very early days with games like Tapsu, but our, our more recent things are War Dragons and Episode. Cool. So yeah, I think there are um, there are definitely a lot of topics uh, that you know we could jump into over here and. Um, there was probably a lot of different areas uh, in terms of uh, what actually helps build a successful game. Um, but let's, let's uh, start with actually the product itself and, and you know, building a title. And, and Brian, you're most probably the guy we should, we should start over there. But you know, when running a studio, um, when, you, uh, when you go ahead and you know, you're, you're, you're building out a title, what does that process actually look like? Um, how are you scoping out what you want to do, and, and um, what, what does the uh, sort of timeline from idea to, to launch look like um, you know, when, when you're doing that? Sure. So I can talk a little bit about how we think about that uh, in the core studio. So just a little bit like the way that Pocket Gems is currently organized is, is around three studios. There's a casual studio. There's a studio building core games, which is what I work on, uh, and then there's a studio doing building episode. And I think the organization of the company sort of reflects how we think about this question okay. um, in that I think, you know, in the early days, uh, this is at least true for Pocket Gems, it's probably true for other guys too, but, um, you know, we kind of just, everyone just sort of built, you know, the best shot at making like a kind of casual, generally accessible game and just hope that it, like lots of people would come play. Uh, but now, I think, you know, there's much more choice for players and so, uh, we're much more uh, specific about the kinds of things we're building, and each studio is very focused on, uh, you know, understanding that market, understanding that, demo that demographic they're building for uh, very specifically, um, and that you know that kind of boils over to the marketing side as well. Different channels are better, um, you know, for different kinds of games, and so for the core studio in particular. Um, you know, when we think about opportunities or what we want to build, like how how we would think about building out a new title, we sort of start from well, what's the mission of the studio? So we're trying to build games in the core studio for. Uh, you know, we're trying to build games that we believe you know, your stereotypical like core PC or console gamer um, would play on mobile, right? And uh, if you go off of that, it's pretty easy just to look and say, okay, well, what's popular in that space generally, right? You look at games like League of Legends, Destiny, like a lot of those games have lots of PvP. They have lots of you know cooperative multiplayer where you can go on raids or you can you know play with your buddy in five v five. So um, we we look to a lot of what's popular kind of in that space that we're going after and and kind of build there. Um, and, and so, so Chris, does that look different for you? Um, yeah, so our process, I'll, I'll talk a bit about it. Um, so at Glue, if a, a new, one of our studio teams is, is ready to take on a new project, the first step that they go through is actually a business case meeting where they prepare a pretty long and in-depth presentation on the game they want to make, present that to the whole executive team. Uh, and so for us, like, for it starts with a similar philosophy around each one of our studios really focusing on what they do best. So if it's our studio in Seattle, they make Deer Hunter, Obviously, they're probably going to be pitching a game that's somewhat similar in the sniping genre. Our studio in Long Beach, they make Racing Rivals. 
they're going to stick to that area of expertise and really building on their IP. Beyond that, that business case covers the entire funnel from why do you think this game is going to download, like what is the marketing strategy, what is the IP that you might be applying to it, through to how are you going to you know, ensure strong retention up front, and all the way ultimately to how are you going to monetize long term. And so that, that's, again, like a long business case presentation that ultimately gets voted on, either gets greenlit or gets sent back for more work. Okay. And w when you're doing that, are you, are you looking at country, country strategy over there, or is it just basically United States? And no, we're definitely, like, we're very global, so with every one of our games, we launch in something like 13 different languages at, at launch. Uh, so part of the business case, too, is who is your core audience, what are the key markets, and how are you going to optimize what you're doing for that audience? Okay. Cool. And, and Barry, with you guys... First, there is a whole empty row up here for all those people in the back and sitting on the floor. Entire row of empty <laughs> seats right here. I still think this um, isn't working. Now so, is. uh, you know, we think about uh, game engines. So we look at developing an engine that we think can be successful with both monetization and retention and engagement. So uh, we like to take things and evolve them. And then when we evolve them to a certain state, that's when we like to throw IP onto it. Um, you know, we took the dot engine and created Blood Brothers, and Blood Brothers eventually became Final Fantasy Record Keeper. Um, is a good example of evolution of an engine that becomes highly monetizing and then we, we throw IP on it. In the West, we took super battle tactics and added transformers. Um, so we generally think about taking something that's been successful in an engine and then adding something to it and, and that's what gets greenlit. And so we already have a base that we're building on from everything that we've done here and in Japan. And then we'll expand on that and add it, what we know we call a plus one. Cool. How do you guys use uh, the beta beta period? You know, when you're launching in you know some smaller country that's maybe similar to, to what you expect. Um, what what do you use the beta period for? What sort of KPIs do you look at um, during that period? So for us, we obviously at the beginning look very closely at retention, next day, seven day, fourteen day, uh, and then beyond that, monetization metrics. Um, we look very closely at the tutorial funnel, so often we've instrumented something like 30 different events in that funnel, and we can look at every single event and see if there's a particular step in the tutorial where we're losing a lot of players. Uh, so heavy focus initially on that first-time user experience, and then as our beta progresses, we look at longer-term retention and ultimately monetization. Cool. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't look at monetization at all because we know that that's what we're good at and we know we've done that so much and have such great ARP DAOs with our games. So we really just focus on retention and engagement. And with you guys, how does that look? Um, I mean, we I think what Chris mentioned, like obviously there's just like a sort of table stakes of KPIs right. that you look at. We definitely look at those as well. I think one thing that's kind of shifted over time about the way that we, we treat those beta periods is um, we're actually we're trying to be more um, like fun-driven, data-informed. Like, I think like, the way we used to build games is we had this kind of general idea, like, oh, animals are cute, we're always gonna make an animal game. We'd throw something out there quickly, look at the data, kind of pivot to like make a fun game from that. And I think that worked you know, three years ago, but it doesn't really work now because okay. the, the quality bar, the expectations from players has gone up, right, for visuals, for game design, for everything. Right. And so now, um, you know, we, tr we, we run those betas, obviously, but we use them as a way to kind of validate or invalidate our hypothesis about whether we're crazy, uh, whether this game is fun, right? Like, somebody internally, like the team building the game, needs to have a, a strong conviction that this is a fun game, right? And I think that stems from doing lots of internal play testing, like, so our prototyping phases are much longer. We do a lot more internal play testing or friends and families type things. Uh, and, you know, if the team believes it's fun, then we use the data to kind of validate whether they're crazy or not, um, which is cool. a little bit different than we used to do. I'll, I'll add one thing. I think one area that uh, I've noticed a lot of studios don't focus on enough in beta is the user acquisition strategy and, like, things like optimizing your icon, your, your creative for all of your campaigns, and overall, like, you know, app store optimization, things like that. We spend a lot of time on that in our beta markets to optimize that for worldwide. Does the strategy differ um, based on title or based on genre that you're, you're approaching? Does that beta strategy differ at all? Or is it just the same across everything? Are there any differences? The same across everything for us because yeah. we generally focus on, on, a, on a couple genres. So, okay. Our strategy could be different. Like if we're looking at, we're about to launch a big action RPG out of our Beijing studio called Eternity Warriors 4. 
I mean, that game is heavily going to skew towards Asian audiences. So things like the countries we choose to focus on in beta are going to differ greatly than a game like Deer Hunter, which is heavily English-speaking, Western market-focused title. Okay. And, and with Pocket Gems, I guess... Yeah, I mean, I think... It, of course, like the baseline metrics you're always looking at, yeah. but um, there are you know game specific metrics we definitely look at that differ depending on the title. So a game like War Dragons, um, where a lot of the end game depth for players is built around like the social experience, like we really try to pay attention to you know how many players are joining guilds, how many people are supporting each other in attacks, because um, that's what we believe is ultimately the most fun and what will lead to long term retention, which is what we're shooting for. Um, obviously, with something like Episode, it's it's completely different. It's more like a media product. We're looking at things like you know number of chapters read. Okay, got it. So the different KPIs. You're looking at KPIs, but the KPIs will be different between the titles based right. on the genre. Makes sense. Okay, so so I guess you know we we've spoken about building uh, building the titles, um, building the games. Um, you go to launch. Um, you're you're launching the title. Uh, what does what does your marketing strategy look like? What does that marketing strategy look like to 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 rank the chart to the top top ten, top twenty? I mean, I, you know, you want Apple and Google to promote your game, but if you're focused on Apple and Google promoting your game, you're you're kind of doing it wrong. It's it's a great springboard, but it's only going to carry you in the first week to ten days, and your game has to sustain itself on on its own. You have to be able to have a good enough LTV at a game at launch, or at least within the first four to six weeks, to be able to spend against it to grow it and and snowball it. Um, you know, there. Lots of different charts that we're that we're talking about. You know, you said chart busting game. Well, there's there's free, there's paid, and then there's grossing, right? And uh, it really depends on what you're trying to build and what chart you're trying to top. We only care about top grossing. Yeah. Um, so for for launch strategy, I mean, for us, it's not a big secret. It's like you know, platform featuring, like you mentioned, obviously go out the gate with a really large UA campaign. Combine that with cross promotion from our other titles. You know, marketing on our social channels. Uh, if we're working with a big licensing partner like a Kim Kardashian, obviously leveraging her distribution channels and marketing power. Um, and, and really for us, it's combining all of that in a very short time window to create a very big launch. Uh, and then I also add that part of the strategy that's now becoming more important, I think, in the ecosystem is a pre launch strategy and actually, you know, pre hyping a game. So it's not just like showing up one day randomly. Yeah, I think. Um we think about marketing for for titles like you know on the performance side around, around like user acquisition LTV CPI and also kind of more on the product side as well now so on the performance side um, it's you know kind of everything they said here it's like it's not, nothing new um, one thing I think we have discovered is as we are splitting into more of like the studio centric model um, you know there's channels that are much much better for casual games much much better for um, core games you know the messaging you want to use is very different for those what does that actually look like what's a channel that's different for a casual I, versus a yeah, core yeah I actually don't work there so I, I can't tell you but um, you know the, the, the guys that I talk to in marketing definitely say like there's some you know, depending on the demographic right there's some okay. there's just uh, you know chart boost I think is much better for casual uh, okay. than for core um, so it's important that each of the studios and each of the people on the marketing side on those studios really understands what they're going after. Um, I think Chris mentioned this point earlier about like spending the time to optimize your creative assets also, which I think we've discovered is like a really uh, strong driver for marketing as well, where um, you know, I think historically a lot of game companies, you spend all this time making your game, it looks great, you go to like make your landing page, you take some screenshots, you throw some text on it, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, you, you'll A-B test it, we're all data driven, so okay, you, you run with the one that's best. Um, but you don't actually spend a lot of time making really high quality assets, right, yep. or the yep. icon. Um, and you know, I think even we recently, uh, you know, we recently brought in, brought on somebody uh, to lead product marketing, and he, uh, you know, he comes from from AAA world, so he he worked at Activision on on marketing Destiny and things like that. And so he went out to an external agency, like did a whole revamp of the War Dragons icon, landing page, video ads, all that, and it's you know made like a you know tremendous like significant difference in like the CTR, like the conversion on the landing page, all of those things. Uh, and so it's it kind. I, yeah, I totally agree. Like the quality of the assets you're putting out actually makes a huge difference. Yeah, one thing I'll say as a tip on that is I see far too often when when studios are trying to optimize their creative, they're testing little variances like should this be red or green? Like that doesn't matter. You should be testing dramatically, dramatically different looks and feels. Makes sense, um, Barry. You you mentioned uh, top pay, top free, top grossing. Um, do you feel there are opportunities um, for let's say you know indie devs that are out there? Um, in any one of those categories that are, that are maybe untapped? I, I don't know if an indie dev can make the top grossing charts today 
with what they're what they're working on. I think there's ways to get into the top free the top or top paid. paid. Right. Um, I think that's a possibility. Um, uh, you know the 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 understanding of how a server works and being able to connect to a server sounds like something very simple, but but it's the hardest possible thing for the the events that we run in our games because when you get that Apple or Google promo, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be making dozens if not hundreds of calls to your server a minute and uh it's tough for an indie shop to kind of figure that out i mean like ea launched the simpsons and their server overloaded right, right? big companies make yeah. mistakes like this which is and why you, which is why you see uh it, it's the yeah. biggest pitfall that indies have when they start thinking about free to play is is this connectivity well, which is most probably why you see indie devs succeeding on the casual side mm -hmm. where there really is no server side. It's all client side and it's simple. They push it out there and you know, if they get a feature or they get lucky or whatever it is. Um, and the other, uh, the other challenge is to survive in top gross thing. Like the depth of your economy has got to be enormous, right? And typical indie games, they just don't design for an economy depth that it's going to support somebody who's going to spend $100,000 in that game. And that's really what you have to be designing for at this point to have a shot at being in like the top 100. Yeah, globally, the amount of content they absorb in Japan and Korea is, <laughs> you know, it's 10x what we absorb here in the same period of time, and yeah. it's it it's it is unreal for what what they're doing. I mean, you got to think about when you go live, when you actually go from your beta to to worldwide at day zero, and that's when you ramp up your team. That's a hard concept for people to understand. It's not when you scale down; it's when you scale up your team. Yeah. Uh, you know, you start hiring outsource shops you got three teams running live events constantly i mean that's not an indie shop right that you're no longer you're, you're now in full bore production and to yeah. get to the top grocery charts even in the top 50 we're not even talking about the top 10 you got to have all that in place that infrastructure are there still benefits to uh to just spending indiscriminately um on launch or whenever just to get into the top x rank and see what you get organically <laughs> I don't think that really works anymore, but the one benefit I will say that there is to going out really big initially, especially if you've built the BI infrastructure to measure everything you're doing on the UA side, is you get a lot of data up front and you quickly realize which channels are going to work best for your particular title and how you can quickly tune for ROI. Okay. Are, are any of you when, you, when you look at you know ROI, return ad spend, whatever you want to call it, um, are you incorporating ad revenues over there as well um, on an automated fashion, or is this just sort of like generic, hey, we make a couple of dollars here, throw it in, add it to the value, or are you like actually you know, tracking that down to the individual user level? We have a few games with ads in it, and we definitely add it to the total ARP DAO, but we're, you know, my Blood Brothers game, this is not a joke, $6 ARP DAO last week. $6 ARP DAO. So we don't have ads in that game, but if we did, a nickel's not yeah. going to add much to that, right? right? But Super Battle Tactics, we were doing 35, 38 cents when we ran events with our Updo, and we were doing like a nickel uh, user. So you know, it right. added, it added to right. definitely help the. So you're not the doing user level mm -hmm. um, tracking over there. You're you're going you're going aggregate um, and just yeah. and just yeah. adding it in. Okay, cool. Cool. So uh, next topic, um, you know, you you've uh, you've bought all these users, um, all these customers, and they're playing the game. Um, retention, I think, is is pretty um, is a pretty important, uh, if not the most important, because you know you can bring in somebody, but uh, that would just be you know incentive incentivize users. You know, you bring in somebody, you want to actually retain them. Um, how do you guys think about retention? Um, what are some tactics um, that you use? And maybe just to simplify it, what's you know what's the most important tactic um, uh, when it comes to retention? Um, so I actually think. I mean, there's a lot of tactics. There's a lot of best practices out there. You should do them, right? Like, do some kind of daily giveaway or bonus. Uh, you know, do a calendar. Like, there's a bunch of best practices that are best practices for a reason. But I think if we're talking about long-term retention, I mean, really, we're talking about game design because it's it, like if the game is fun, people are going to come back and play it, and you can help them along through these tactics. But you know, your tactics aren't going to change like the underlying story for a game that isn't inherently fun. And so, for us, like when we think about long-term retention, we're really trying to think about you know, fundamental game design frameworks. And fortunately, like, we don't have to invent these, right? Like, people have been making games for a long time. So, uh, you know, if, 
if you haven't uh, you know, heard about or, or listened to like Scott Rigby talk about player experience of need satisfaction, where you know, players are trying to have demonstrated increases in competency, autonomy, like relatedness every time they play your game, right? Like there's a bunch of frameworks that exist out there. You don't have to invent them. Um, and we, we use those to look at our games because that you know it's been proven again and again that like the most long-lasting games uh, you know motivate players through these different mechanics and so uh, for us it's, you know the tactics are given we're going to do them but you know really it's about making the game like the most fun possible. I'll share actually a very very tactical thing that I picked up the other week when I was out in China for China Joy. Um, so a lot of games do the, like the daily bonus, which is like free. Open the game every day, you get a bonus. Uh, but what I saw in a lot of Chinese games is they've actually turned that into a paid thing where if you spend $5, you get a monthly kind of pack where you effectively over the course of that month can get $30 in value, but you have to log in every day to keep collecting that. So it's like com not only does it have the daily bonus yes. mechanic, but it's combining it with actually converting people to spenders. Yeah, that's a good tactic. Um, do you oh, think that but let's but but r obviously retention is the biggest number, right? When you start thinking about the 30-day retention, if you're over 12%, you're in great shape. But but the other thing that we really think about is engagement and time, right? So so you if you sleep eight hours a day, well, if you're lucky, you sleep eight hours a day, and then you you know you work eight hours a day, and then you you know you eat X number. Of day. How much time do you actually have in your day for free time? Like you know, three to four hours max in your day. We look at a game where if, you're, if we're getting over 30 minutes engagement, 40 minutes engagement from a user, we're onto something, right? We're definitely onto something. So, you know, when we start seeing, uh, uh, you know, we had a game that was, it was 61 minutes on average a day that people were playing. It was 61 minutes. I couldn't fathom that they were, they were spending that much time in this one game, you know, but when you knew you were onto something. So I think you, you also need to think about how long they're playing in that game and at what point they can actually spend or engage with your economy when they're in that game. So, so, so both of those things work hand in hand together, but you know, you want to get a chart busting game. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it sounds like you know, you guys are going back to the product, which obviously is the most important product. I mean, the game has to be really good. But like, so so Chris, I think you had one good tactic over there. That's pretty interesting. Um, do you guys find that like notifications, social, um, like any 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 of those actually still work today? Are they like big drivers of bringing back traffic? Um, is there a way to integrate those into the core game loop so that they actually it actually makes sense to integrate those rather than spam? Social has been really big for us, obviously, with the Kim game, given how big her social following is and how we've been able to continuously tie into that with the in-game content. Uh, so if you play the game, like a lot of the events that we launch in the game are timed with what Kim is doing in the real world. So we launched Paris as a region, Australia, like as Kim was actually visiting those places. So when she's posting on her social about being there, and on top of that posting that, hey, you can go visit Paris too in the game, that was, it's been a huge driver of re-engagement uh, for us. That, that still seems like a marketing strategy versus It's like marketing, but combined right. with in-game content, not just right. purely marketing, right? I think that's the important part. It's not just marketing for marketing's sake, but it's actually tying back to what users are experiencing in the game. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, building social into the core loop makes a lot of sense if you if you can do it well like it makes a huge difference right like if you're looking at the most successful core pc games of all time like or the ones that are most popular right now like they all have some level of social component right like people are playing with their friends on destiny going on raids like you're playing with your friend on league of legends right so um you can build them into your game in a way that's not like this weird tacked on like invite your friend to unlock this region thing right and so i think for us like one of our strategies with war dragons is to try and uh, really push people, push players into guilds because you know we, we've we've measured it and like the people who stay in active guilds like play much longer. Like it seems obvious, right? And so um, a lot of the stuff that we've built in that game is around supporting that social experience. So for example, we built in the ability to you know create and edit wikis in the game itself. Uh, you know to have a forum for your guild in the game itself. So giving players the tools to create like these rich social, social experiences in the app itself, because that's what ultimately what they want to do without having to leave, right? And I think giving people those tools is, uh, is a great way to like extend you know, like the retention of the game. Makes sense. 
Okay, cool. I think I think that's that's good. It's insightful. Um, so so moving towards modernization, I guess sort of uh, the the uh, the final piece over here. Um, you know, you brought you brought the users, you retained them, and now um, you're looking to monetize them. You know, as part of as part of uh, the experience. So you know, you have in-app purchasing, you have ad revenues, etc. Um, what are some of the uh, sophisticated strategies that you guys use on the in-app purchasing side? Are there any sophisticated strategies, or is it more of just like, hey, this is what we have in the game pack, and that's it? Or are you doing things around segmentation and, and other things um, within the titles, or just in general, what are some interesting things oh. that you guys are doing? We just got lucky with the $6 ARP DAO. There was no strategy at all involved in any that was just... You just put an interstitial yeah. that says, like, spend money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. we, we run events, and we, and we think of events differently than, than most people think about events. Um, it really is down to a science in Japan about um, finding the different level of user and being able to delight and engage them uh, on three, four, five, six, seven day events with enough content to keep them interested in buying. So there's your casual user in, in your mid-core game that will never spend money, right? There's, there's people that will just not spend money, but you, you have to keep those people engaged in a part of your part of your game loop and part of your, at least your infrastructure, it's important for the game's ecosystem. You have to be able to engage them at the same level you're engaging your mid-core user that is gonna spend 20 bucks a month on your game. And then you also have to keep that whale engaged that you're talking about where, the, where they're gonna spend tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in your game. And you, the way we run these events is so scientific down to the, we're tuning by the minute, by the hour, whatever, to make sure that everyone's engaged at the right level. If, if it takes 100 dragons to kill to get to the next level, and we're like, oh shoot, only 16% have gone on, we'll start throwing more dragons in there, right? So we, we actually tune it down to those levels to get that engagement, to get that monetization going. Um, it, the science is beyond me. But thank God for the guys in Japan <laughs> that, that brought it, right? it to us. So, I'll say another actually tactical thing that, uh, that Western companies don't really do, but uh, I've noticed that Asian companies are all about this, which is like very close management of their VIP spenders, their big spenders, where they will actually like have a customer care representative re representative that manages just ten of these people and makes sure that they're like really happy at all times. VIP service. That's that's great. Yeah, I, I would definitely echo the events thing. I mean, for War Dragons, it's like a huge piece of what we do. I think for for most core games, um, you know, events are like the biggest driver by far of monetization. I think also to echo, you know, your points, uh, if if you are not playing games uh, from Japan and China, you, like, you're missing out. Like those guys are like on the cutting edge for monetization uh, and free to play. Um, and I have a few ideas for games if you <laughs> want to see me after. Yeah. Well, we can ask you about them later. So, Brian, uh, are you familiar with what episode does over there, or is yeah, I can talk about it a little. Yeah, yeah. be curious. Um, so, episode is our, our take on like an interactive storytelling platform. It's like a pretty different. We we almost don't call it a game. Um, you know, it's a way for uh, there's a UGC side to it. There's like a first party side where we're creating stories. Um, we have a, a Demi Lovato story coming out, a Mean Girl story, um, and. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things that we've been thinking about, I think this is probably you know, a, a good to topic to talk to you guys about around like IP and like how you p work with different um, partners. But for us, you know, we've been thinking, okay, well, in a world where obviously everyone's going to look at the Kim Kardashian game and say, oh, I, I want to do that. Um, so like in a world where every celebrity has a game, like how do you stand out? Um, and so we're trying to use episode as a way to tell like stories very specific to you know the celebrity or to the IP. So for example, like in Demi Lovato, you know you're you're playing somebody who's like trying to be an up and coming singer, and you know we have the rights to play her music in the game, and so you actually like get on stage and sing with her, and like the music is playing. Obviously, that's like a very different experience than what you'll have in Mean Girls, where it's like about trying to figure out which click to join, and um, and so we can use episode as a platform to kind of extend the you know the brand of the person or of the of the original IP, um, and really tell like a unique story and kind of like build out that fan base cool interesting so i think for all three of your companies ip is is most probably pretty important or at least it it, it seems to be important um is that the case i mean is there a reason why everybody out there is is trying to attach themselves to something um or is that sort of just uh it's uh it's sort of something that you know companies are doing and it's great let's go ahead and do it or is it a necessity i mean we're we're doing it not as necessity, but uh, f 
for monetization reasons, right? Because we're attaching ourselves to Final Fantasy. Um, you know, we've got a partnership with Nintendo coming. We've got, you know, we've got these 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 brands. We we have Transformers and Marvel and Star Wars. It's not just for the lower uh, CPI costs, yep. al yep. although it it helps, it helps. for sure. Yeah. It's not a, but like I said, when we have a game engine that can make a $6 ARP DAO, well, it makes sense to try to attach a license to it to get people more engaged in that concept, right? So it, it as, a, as a strategy, we never start with the IP. We never start with, hey, you know, we have the ability to get a Marvel license, so let's create a Marvel game. We always start with, hey, um, we have a great game engine. It really fits for Marvel because this is what we want to do with it. Let's right. go pitch that to Disney. So it's an accelerant, not exactly a necessity. <laughs> yeah, I think Barry brings up a great point about the real value of IP being much more about monetization. I think too often people think of it as purely a downloads thing or a marketing thing. Like if you're thinking about it that way, you're not really working with the right IP because there's plenty of IP out there that'll help you get downloads, but they're not. It won't help you bring in passionate users and. It won't bring that emotional connection that's actually going to get people that are going to stick around and play your game for a long time and spend a lot of money. So that's how we really think about, you know, if we're going to work with a licensed IP partner, it's much more about do you tap into a passionate audience that's really going to stick around and engage with the content for a much longer period of time. I engaged and spent more money in Kim Kardashian <laughs> than I'm willing to admit in public <laughs> right now, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> I wasn't one of the MVPs, <laughs> per se. Keep trying. <laughs> yeah, we won't hold it against you. So, so uh, what what company, um, you know, not on the stage over here, would each of you sort of say, hey, this is a, this is a company doing doing great things, building great games, um, building great experiences, and, and a company that everybody should study and model. Well, well, what Supercell's doing, right? Supercell, uh, they, they're, they're coming out now and talking about how they want to be the blizzard of the mobile game industry, where they're going to take, you know, 10 to 12 person teams and let them spend, you know, uh, you know an, an, a year in our, you know, space is a long time, right? So a year or two creating and building games, and if it doesn't work, they're not going to release them. It's great to be able to have that war chest to be able to go and do that. Um, you can't start with that in mind, but now that they do have that, you know, I admire the fact that they've actually, you know, they've killed like 12 games in the, in the past two years. It's, it's great. But, uh, but I admire the, the two companies next to me. I mean, everyone that's trying to do something different, um, you know, what, the, the thing that came out in your earnings was when Niccolo talked about all the, the people you had signed, the thing that people missed was they were talking about the names, but it wasn't the names that he was emphasizing. 650 million Twitter followers was the number that was in there. That was the emphasis, right? And I don't think he's going to stop till he hits a billion. You could tell me after. <laughs> but I don't think he's going to, because that, that's a huge marketing power. Yeah, and what, sure. you know, the way you guys are doing it with episodes, I mean, I think that's, that's it, it's different, it's innovative, it's unique. Um, everyone has to innovate in this space. If you're trying to build a match three, where's your innovation? Yeah. You know, do you, do you have it? So stay innovative, stay creative. Um, and and go for the home runs. Go for the chart busting games because if you're trying to get a game, it's uh, you know if you want to live in the in the top you know 200 grossing, um, that's fine. But that's that's not the business we should be in. Um, I'll add. I think I I really admire what Machine Zone did with Game of War um, because that to me is an example of like doing it the hard way, which was taking the entire company of 200 something people for 18 months or whatever it was and intentionally building like the deepest strategy game in the world or in, at least in the western world uh, and backing that with a super aggressive and sophisticated marketing strategy so that wasn't like a random hit that they got lucky with like they really did that the hard way so i really admire what they did yeah i think uh the game i would particularly point out is hearthstone where you know, obviously blizzard has a lot of experience on on pc building amazing games but this was you know their first free to play game um first like big mobile game uh, and a lot of people were really skeptical for a long time you know a lot of like the the core gaming audience was like oh this game is pay to win or it's like it's not as complicated as magic um but they've done a really good job supporting it adding new content building uh you know like just continuing to to, to like uh to run it um and it's you know it's paid off for them and i think for us that's really inspiring in the core studio because we we aspire to make games that um, you know that those the people who play Blizzard games would want to play, and so I think there's some you know Hearthstone is definitely something we look up to there. Yeah, I think that's good, and I think uh, you know obviously you know you you look at Machine Zone, Supercell, you know, and, and and King. Those are sort of like the three big ones. 
I'm sure. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other companies that have done a great job. You guys also. Um, so, so there was probably a lot of indie devs out here. Um, I'm sure. And um, I mean, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit. And, and before we wrap up, I, I really wanted to, to sort of ask this question and see where, where you think there's opportunity. Um, you know, where does an indie dev get started today? Um, can, can they become successful? Um, and, you know, success to varying degrees, of course. But where should they look to start out? Um, is there a particular category? Is there a particular genre? Is there a particular, you know, um, you know paid, free, grossing, uh, you know, purchasing driven? What is it that they should look for? And uh, where is a, a very specific opportunity that's most probably um, somewhat untouched today? Well, I, mean, I think as an indie dev, you have to figure out where you want to be, right? Do you want to be in the top free? Do you want to be in the top grossing? Do you want to be in the top paid? And, and then you got to find your passion around that because you're, uh, it's hard to break into anything in, the, in this space, but there's definitely room that's a beautiful thing about this space is that you never know what you know crossy roads like who would have expected that to be a, a top game and those guys made millions of dollars right like it, it's n i know it's not just about that well but they're making it's millions of dollars so. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. it's possible so so if you you know be realistic about where you want to shoot but but shoot as shoot as high as you can go yeah i think also for indie devs i mean the key is to, to take major risk on being innovative because the bigger companies over time, I mean, you, you end up having to manage your risk really tightly. And as, as a result, you become less innovative in some ways. It's like the Hollywood model. You're going to do Iron Man 3 instead of some random new movie. Whereas indie devs have that freedom to really take a shot at building something that hasn't been built before, uh, which is, I think, really the best opportunity for an indie. It's not just to go try to copy an existing big game, because you're going to get crushed. You know, the opportunity is really to big so build something that's truly new. Yeah. And I, I think as part of that, thinking about if somebody sees like a single screenshot of your game, like how are you, how are you going to stand out across, you know, out of the, the millions and millions of games that people can play? Um, I think Crossy Road did that. Monument Valley did that. I think there's reasons why a lot of those really successful indie games worked. It's because like you can see you know, over somebody's shoulder or you see an ad for it, you know, you just see it like, in, you know, an editor's choice. And it's like, wow, that looks different, right? Like, what's your edge? Like, what, what are you building that's going to look different and stand out from everyone else? Um, I think that's what you have to go after. So we're going to run into a Q&A in, in two minutes, but um, are there any closing comments um, that you guys wanted to bring up over here just based on the, on the panel and the topic um, that we just discussed? I mean, I think disruption can happen anywhere at any time by any developer, including indie developers. So if you really, f if you really have something innovative and different, it, it can surface and it can come to the top and you can disrupt the charts. I mean, three years ago this month, the number one and two top grossing games were DNA. And then Candy Crush and, and Supercell came out and, and they crushed us, right? And, and, and we're recovering from that and recovering well. But um, it, it, you know, it, three years is a really, really, really long time in this industry. And those three games, I don't think will be at the top of the charts in three years. So why can't it be your game? You know? But just uh, be disruptive. I think the the other meta point I would add is, uh, you know, I think early like three years ago there were a lot of tricks you could probably do. You know, the, the environment was very different, um, and uh, there were some some sort of shortcuts you could take to getting to the top of the charts. You know, in different ways, um, and I, I think that's just not really the case now. Um, you know, the expectation from players in terms of visual quality, in terms of game design quality, the marketing quality, like all of that has gone up, and so, uh, you know there aren't really any shortcuts. It's like you have to make a really fun game that's really high quality. And in some ways, it's like, uh, it's kind of sad there's no, there's no shortcut. But it's also kind of nice if you are a game developer because uh, I think most of us got into the business of making games because we want to make fun games. And so that is really what you should be doing. Um, it's like really all you can do. Yep, and I agree with these, what these guys said. And what I'll add is like, I'd also recommend don't spread yourself too thin. Uh, too often I see indie developers already worrying about how am I going to launch in China, Korea, Ad revenue, UA, like too much stuff. Just focus on the game first, and all the rest of the stuff can come after you have a successful title. Yeah, don't think about Asia. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> it's it, if you look at the the Japan, right? It's the number one grossing mobile market. You know, seven billion dollars or whatever. Um, not one game in the top five is built outside of Japan. Like, it just those those countries are different. You know, there's revenue to be had there, but it's it's you're you're you know it's going to be really 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 hard to break into it. Get a hit game in the West, get a hit game in your region, and focus there. 
Great, thank you. Um, any questions? I think you guys have an opportunity over here to, to ask some good ones. Maybe you could uh, talk about like the top three mistakes that can really hurt you in an otherwise innovative game. I'll start with one. One mistake I see is not thinking about your audience or user acquisition strategy up front. Like, you know, like some studios will be like, oh, I love sci-fi theme, but that might not be the right theme to help you get downloads. So I see that too often as like not being considered from day one, uh, what is the user acquisition strategy? Um, you know, you might, when you launch a game, you think where people are gonna engage with your game and where the content's gonna go, but you might not be right. And don't be so arrogant to not listen to your users. Like, listen to your users and create the content and build the features around what they're engaging with, not what you think they're engaging with. Uh, yeah, a third one I would add is really understanding what the demographic uh, of the game you're trying to make, like what they expect. So uh, this is very easy to screw up on like a core game, right? Core gamers are already skeptical of mobile games. They're like, oh, they're not real games. They're, you know, they're all like pay to win. So if you're trying to make something that's going after that market, you really need to understand like what like sets them off versus what's okay. Uh, and, you know, building your monetization in a way that's like very acceptable to them. Like Hearthstone is an example of that, but even they had trouble when they launched. So I think it's just really important to be very aware of like the biases for each of the, you know, demographics you're going after. And I think just, uh, just to add on, on, uh, on my side, at least what we see, I mean, we work with thousands of developers, and uh, I think one mistake that, that we actually do see quite often is over monetization of users um, versus sort of like neutral or just sort of taking it easy and taking it slow and figuring it out. So, you, you know, you'll see, you'll see some indie devs that will throw, you know, throw an interstitial um, or a video, like, you know, after every level in a casual game. They're like, well, why am I CPN 25 cents? And it's, well, it's like because your user just saw 100 ads and they're never going to come back. So, you know, and we do see that mistake quite often. So you guys are kind of touching on this, but I'm wondering, being at the top level, are you seeing any indications of fatigue in the free-to-play free market? I mean, some of these techniques are, are seen and one of the things I find really refreshing about Hearthstone is it's free to play, but it's not in your face free to play. You know, many of us got into this because we love games and as these mechanics are proving successful, then, you know, you identify them early in the process and it's like, oh, okay, well, this is just gonna be another, you know, endless loop worthy of being ribbed by uh, South Park. You know, are, are you guys seeing that kind of thing? And are you guys, do you have any current projects that are, are moving, I, I don't know, kind of more towards the love as a result of that? I mean, I can certainly say, like, we believe, on, you know, at Pocket Gems on the Core Studio that that's where we want to try and move to. Um, you know, the game that I'm working on under development right now is very much more in, like, that Hearthstone model and uh, future games we're working on. We're, we're trying to do that. Um, I think... Uh, there is a belief that you know the, the your typical PC gamer or console gamer is probably still relatively small on mobile right now in terms of percentage, um, but over time they're going to be you know a very significant if not majority part of the market. And uh, so figuring out how to cater to them in a way that is palatable, that is not like pay to win, um, but still allows you to make lots of money is uh, you know an interesting challenge, and it's definitely something that we're we're trying to go after. I think the biggest change I've seen in player behavior is. Uh, you know, like say, call it three years ago, you could still do really well as a purely single player free to play game. Um, whereas now user interest in engaging in single player games is kind of plummeted. Like they're not willing to spend money just to finish a single player linear game. Uh, it has to be much more about deep socio competitive components driving their behavior. Any other questions? Great, thank you.